how to write a test-driven development style unit test in Java. You'll be aware that test-driven development is a very popular technique these days. It aims to give you a really fast feedback loop on your design to check that your design is growing well and in a right way that's properly decoupled and easy to maintain. And it also, of course, gives you great feedback on the actual functionality. So you may recall in the olden days we had software full of off-by-one errors and things like that. Well, with test-driven development, you'll have a test to catch that sort of behaviour. So it's really helpful. So how do we do this in Java? Uh, I'm going to be using uh, Java 8 in IntelliJ and the unit testing framework JUnit and a helper framework called Hamcrest, which allows us to write clearer tests, and another helper framework called Makito. And I'm going to specifically use an example to help demonstrate that. So let's get to it. The classic toy example, let's make a calculator that adds two numbers together. So to do that, we will create a new Java class and the convention is to call it calculator test. So with this first part of the name being the name of the object uh, actually under test and it's an ordinary class. Really must get around to turning that off one day. Ho hum. And we simply start by having a think. So, what do we want our calculator class to do? Uh, we want it to add two numbers, and for the purpose of this example, we want it to pull those numbers from a source. Uh, we're going to use dependency injection on that source so that we can change it, uh, so that it could pull numbers from a CSV file, or from the keyboard, or from test stub data. So, our first test should be to check that this calculator can in fact add two numbers. And to mark this as a test, simply add the annotation at test, which will pull in from JUnit. Now another big feature of test-driven development is how you write the tests themselves. They consist of three parts. So the first part is where at the top of the test where you arrange all your items. So you create the objects and you create test data. The second part of the test is where you actually do the action you want to test. So in our case, we're going to be calling the add two numbers method. The third section uh, is the asserts where we actually check that the right things have happened. And it's best in test driven development to write those in reverse order. So you put your assert first, then you put your act above it and you put your arrange at the top. So let's go through that. So our assert is our first design decision. So we are going to assume that we have a calculator object. And so we're going to create a new local variable for that. You can see here we've newed up our calculator class and we can now create that class. By doing this, we can now add the public API that we want to test on this calculator class. So we're going to call it add two numbers. And hopefully we're going to spell it right. And that's going to return us, in this case, a long result. So we've now written the act part and we've also defined the method signature. So before we've written any production code, we've had a little think about how we want the design to look. We've decided we want a method that takes no parameters. It's going to add two numbers somehow, and it's going to return a result, and that that result's going to be of type long. So we can now use the code completion of IntelliJ with Alt Enter there to go away and create this method. And very helpfully, it puts in a return zero for us. So we've now got something which will actually compile, although obviously it won't do anything just yet. So the next piece is to finally get onto our assert. And for here we use the hamcrest assert that method. And I like this simply because it makes for a very readable test.
and it reads left to right. So we assert that the result is a particular value. So we've now got a little red flag on IntelliJ. That is, is going to need some long value. So what are we going to do for that? Well, my view is that we should define two constants for the first number and the second number. And then we can check that they add together correctly. So let's do that at the top of our test file, create two private static final longs. Uh, so if we now run this test, we'll find that it runs, but it doesn't pass. And this is a very, very useful thing in test-driven development. Because we now have our first failing test. So whilst IntelliJ builds the sources for the first time, it's worth mentioning that the red bar that you can see on the screen is part of a rhythm, uh, a definite cadence, a definite uh, workflow uh, in test-driven development. We aim to get first a red bar. So we've got a test that we're satisfied is the answer that we want. It's checking for the answer that we want in production code we haven't yet written. So when we run the test, obviously it'll fail because we don't have the production code, so it can't possibly pass. Brilliant. So that's a red bar. The next job is to then add the production code to make the test pass. And that uh, will result in a green bar. And then after that, we pause for a moment and we think, is that really the best way of doing it? So now we've got a passing test. We're free to just be able to refactor our code at will. We might extract methods, we might rename variables for clarity, we might split things up, we might change orders around. And this forms a, a big, what's called the red-green refactor cycle of test-driven development. So we're at the first phase of that now for this particular test. We've got a red bar. So let's add some production code. We go over to our production class over in the source directory and we see that the add two numbers return zero. Now, to make the test pass, we could do a trick I first learned of from Robert Martin, which is to simply put in a constant value and make the test pass. And that sort of proves something that's kind of the spirit of a very lean kind of development. But I prefer to add a slightly different step. Let's return to our original thinking. This calculator class is going to add two numbers, and we said it's going to get them from a source. So let's add the code to do that. Let us call our source number source, and let us have it with a method called fetch next number. Now we're getting some red there, because obviously number source isn't known to our calculator class. So I want to create a field of number source for our calculator class. I don't want it to be object, I actually want it to be number source. Now clearly, more red, because we don't know about number source. I want to create that as an interface. All good. We go back to the calculator class and the red now is because the method that we decided on doesn't exist on the interface. And now it does. So looking now at our production objects, we've got an interface which allows us to dependency inject in different sources of numbers and that's that critical part that allows us to swap software around. It's part of the open close principle. But we haven't actually initialized it. So if we run this now, we're going to get a null pointer exception. And that's always worth trying. So if we look at the bottom of the screen, our red bar, instead of being an assertion error, where it was expecting a certain value, it's now simply going to be null pointer exception. Everybody's favorite Java exception. So let's try and sort this out. The way to do that is to then assign this number source to something. Now the way we're going to do this is using a dependency injection. We're going to add a constructor and that constructor is going to take in a number source which we can make final 
because once we've passed this in and wired the object up, we're not bothered about what happens anymore. Uh, we don't, we're not bothered about changing it rather anymore. Uh, and this will cause our test now to fail because where we nude up the calculator object in the test, in the arrange step, that's not valid anymore because we did have it with a default constructor. Now we need to pass in a number source. So currently we've only defined an interface for our number source, which is what it's actually going to look like. But we've not defined any implementation or production code for it yet. At this point, we could think about writing some sort of implementation, perhaps a CSV reader. But how does that feel to you? To me, that feels like we're just taking it a bit of a step too far there. So what we normally do in test-driven development is write a stub object. And here we're going to use the rather excellent Mokito library to do that. So we go into our test class and we are going to write some, a method that, ref that, if I can get over my words, a method that runs before each test and does a setup phase for the tests. I'm going to use the library Makito Annotations, which has what I think of as just some boilerplate code. Makito Annotations dot init mocks with a reference to this, this being the test class itself. That sets up the Makito system, so we're able to create some fake stub objects. And we're going to do that in the next step. To do this, we will create a private field of our number source interface. And to define it as a mock, we type the Makito annotation at mock. The at mock annotation combined with the init mocks, brackets this, is enough for Makito to now create as a real functioning number source. Even though we've got no real classes yet, it will use CGLib magic to create one for us. And we can set various values with that to make sure it does the right thing. So what we specifically want it to do for our test is when we call the source and we call the fetch number method on it, we want it to then return our test values. So I need to import that. And it's usually nice to clean up some of our imports. So at line 22 there, the when source.fetch number, what that's saying is that the first time we call, in fact, what that's saying is every time we call source.fetch number, it's always going to return first number for us. Because we specifically want to test the behavior with two different numbers, we're going to use the Mokito uh, facility to, to return different numbers on each call. And to do that, you simply put in a comma separated list of them. So like this. What that piece of syntax says is that when we call fetch num next number the first time, we get first number. And when we call it the next time, we get second number. So if we run our test now, if we make our test compile now, Yes, I've just called that the wrong thing. Uh, the line 28 failure there is because I've got an auto-generated variable called number source, and for reasons best known to myself, I called it source in the test on line 17. We have to change one to the other. For today, I think I will actually change the variable name in the field, number source. Oh yes, and that one too. So we should be able to run this test now. And this now is a correctly built up test. Correctly built up test it might be, but I see we've got a null pointer exception. And to be honest, I wasn't actually expecting that. So let's check through the code. So we've got 
before each test. Ah yes, I've fallen for a classic problem when using Makito. If you look cl closely, I've written a method at line 19 currently of before each test, but it never gets called at all because nothing calls it. And it needs an annotation to call that method before each test. It's a bit of an oops, but easily fixed before. So that annotation now, which I thought I was going to type in earlier, should run this before each test. And that should result in us having the test still fail, that's what we're expecting, but it should now fail because we're getting the wrong answer. So if we look down in the console window, we expected the result of the two uh, numbers being added up, but we actually only got one number being added up. So this is where test-driven development is very, very useful. You can see that we, we've not yet made the production code correct, but we've already got a test to fail that tells us that. And because we keep these tests in our pipeline and in our continuous integration system, it's going to carry on and on and on telling us that as a regression test. And that can be really handy. In fact, it is a really handy way of making sure that the quality of your code is high and that it does actually work as you hope it's going to work. So if we step into the add two numbers, what we want to do for our system, remember this is our design choice. We want to get it so that our calculator, when we call add two numbers method, it calls fetch next number on the number source and then to get the first number, and then it calls fetch next number again to get a second number and then calls the add method. Now, that looks pretty good to me, pretty good software. So we're gonna run that test, and I'm expecting, unless there's something else I've forgotten about, for it to go green. And I'm quite pleased that it did, and there's no more errors. Now, obviously I was doing that live. I've been doing this for many years, um, but I'm kind of busy also speaking as well. So, you can see the real value of test-driven development. Uh, you can find out very quickly and with a very fast feedback loop where you've forgotten things, where you've just overlooked things. These are really simple beginner's errors that I've been making. But without uh, a unit test approach, they could potentially just go straight through into production. Uh, or they would certainly go to the QAs who would then bounce them back because none of this stuff would work. So what we've covered here is basic rhythm of how we do test-driven development in Java. Uh, we've followed the red-green refactor workflow because we made a failing test with a red bar. We then wrote the production code and perfected the production code to get a green bar. And we're now in the phase where we could refactor our code. We're not going to do that in this tutorial because it's just the, the first simple feature that we've put in a simple exercise. We've also seen that the test code itself when we write an actual test method, add to numbers, I wanted to call it, add to numbers, follows this three step process. We have a, an assert at the end to check that we actually get the result we expected. We have an action in the middle, which is where we actually run the production code that we want to test. And we have an arrange step at the start, which is where we wire up any objects that collaborate together to make all this happen. So, a very simple example, very contrived toy example. I'm not sure that's the world's most useful calculator and I doubt very much we'll be selling it on the App Store. But that's how test-driven development works. And it's a very nice, very rhythmic cycle, a very good way to develop professional software.